Facing Two Ways, The Story of My Life, by Baroness Shizu Ishimoto. Part 1. My Peaceful Childhood in Half-Westernized Tokyo. Chapter 1. My Father and Mother. I was born into a samurai family of Tokyo, so I began life as a member of a caste. Today, there is less significance in such a fact, but when I was born, it still meant a good deal, as Japan had thrown off feudalism only 30 years before. At the time of my birth, the four classes, the samurai, tillers of the earth, artisans, and traders, were still distinct. Thus, for generations, my ancestors had been loyal retainers of a daimyo, one of whose descendants is the present Count Abe. Count Abe's feudal estate was situated in the middle west of Japan proper, on the coast of the Inland Sea, a place of beautiful scenery and mild climate. On a neighboring estate lived the daimyo whose retainers' loyalty is immortalized in the popular play, <clears throat> Chushpin Gura or the Forty Seven Ronin. Daimyos were heads of feudal clans, and in the days of the Tok. Kugawa Shogunate Japan was divided into about 300 of these. The rank of each daimyo was calculated by the amount of rice his land produced. For instance, the measurement of rice crops from the lands which belonged directly to the Tokugawa central government called Tenrao the land of heaven, measured eight million koku, and the former lands of Prince Shimazu, Marquis Mori, and Marquis Maeda, the three wealthiest daimyos of the time, counted about one million koku each. Our family's daimyo, Count Abe, was of the middle rank, owning about 100,000 koko worth of land round his Fukuyama castle, whose noble outline with its snow-white plaster walls supporting a succession of heavy-gaveled, mild-sloping roofs, their gray tiles framed against the blue sky, can still be seen from the train windows if one knows where to look. Every samurai family belonged to one of the 300 daimyos and rendered him civil and military service. The daimyo's income, chiefly in the form of rice, was allotted from his treasury to the families in his service according to their rank in the economic and social hierarchy. Within the clan, and for generations the income was inherited by the samurai descendants, with almost no change in the amount from the beginning to the end of the Tokugawa period. The eldest son became the head of the family after the death or retirement of his father, and the samurai rights were all dependent on this heir. If a father had no son, all the family privileges were lost. An heir was of the utmost importance, therefore, and many concubines were retained to assure the birth of a son. Following the arrival of a boy, babies were coldly received into the family, if at all, for they would only impoverish it by consuming its strictly limited income. These children were plainly distinguished from the heir and were called 
cold rice. They had to be satisfied with cold leftover food, while the heir enjoyed the freshly cooked warm rice. The stern moral code of this daimyo and samurai class called Bushido, which has been made widely known to the Western world by Dr. Inanzo Nitobe, bore a good many resemblances to the moral code of Western chivalry. Both stood for honor and the defense of the weak. The starting point of samurai training was the cultivation of this sense of honor and protection. The Bushido Code taught the samurai that the worst thing he could possibly do was to bring shame on the Lord and on his own family. Harakiri, an honorable suicide by disemboweling, was encouraged, and when a samurai felt that he had committed a dishonorable act, he killed himself to compensate for it. Another typical attitude of life as revealed in this Bushido moral code was Stoicism, coming from Buddhist teachings. The Japanese samurai renounced personal desire of any kind. This was appropriate in a country so poorly endowed with natural resources. Bushido was well practiced in the days of feudalism. Warriors did not have to worry about their livelihood. They had only to consider how to behave according to conventions. However, after the Meiji political restoration, which was completed in 1868, feudalism was replaced by a new social system based on modern industrialism. The samurai suddenly lost their security of living, whether they had heirs or not, and had no training with which to meet the new social order. Their traditional moral principle deprecate the material value of things, and be loyal to thy lord was a positive handicap, as feudalism was being undermined by western materialism. The samurai conception that it was shameful to work for direct material remuneration made the starved warrior sit passively at a table heaped with plates of wood and fish, put there just for show, and pretend he had eaten enough by using a toothpick in a satiated ma manner. The toothpick, which often horrifies the visitor from the West, has a long and honorable history. My father, Ritaro Hirota, who was born two years before the Meiji rest Restoration, faced difficulties and privations in his boyhood, and was one of those who struggled in the tide of this great social change. But the samurai class soon developed ambition, and my father was urged to study at the Imperial University of Tokyo, which was being organized on the western basis of education. Only a selected few could secure the privilege of entry. There he studied science as a training to be a mechanical engineer. In my father's boyhood, students learned their history and literature from Chinese books and modern science through European languages. As paper manufacturing and printing in those days were still done in the old-fashioned way, my father could not afford expensive books. He copied from cover to cover the whole volume of a Chinese-Japanese dictionary that he needed greatly. This is only one instance of the great efforts made by the students of early Reconstruction days. On leaving the university, my father pulled his boat up the stream of awakening industry, where this young, inexperienced engineer was well received. The hectic years of establishing factories with new machines of high efficiency changed our land 
of the Lotus Dream into a country of whistles and smoking chimneys. How many huge chimneys have I seen rising round high temple towers and against the picturesque green hills of the seashore? My father would proudly tell me that these were his great contribution to industrial Japan, at which I would smile, saying to myself, that couldn't be helped in those days. The marriage of my father to my mother was, of course, not a love match. According to the Japanese custom, it was arranged by the parents as a family affair, or indeed an affair of two families. Both belonged to the samurai caste, and the honorable marriage was effected by a go-between who satisfied the families concerned that the standards of culture and family tradition were well balanced, although my father, as an engineer with Western training, had an outward appearance of modernity. Psychologically, he was controlled by the feudal code of the old regime. He stayed in a mental world with my grandfather, who dared not step out from this conservatism, feeling great pride in his family traditions. This samurai pride may be said to have been the motive power of the mid Meiji reaction against the swift and superficial westernization of Japan, the basis of national consciousness crying for the abolition of extraterritorial rights and other ill-considered treaties with the Western countries. Thus my father, wearing a Western suit and hat, understanding English well, designing factories in modern style, was in his private life thoroughly imbued with the feudalistic ideology. He was during my childhood, and he still is, a samurai, not with the sword girded at his side, but with the engineer's ruler in his pocket. My father has had very regular habits all through his life. He does not like to use the word about, while Japanese usually speak and act with the about. He acts with the precision his ruler and scales indicate, the only exception being when he gives his order to the maids at table. He may say that he likes to measure his sake, rice wine, a little more generously than precisely, with a sly glance at my mother's face. He is gifted in music and likes to play the bamboo flute and sing folk songs, but according to his stoic samurai principle, he believes that the encouragement of pleasure will ruin the nation and refrains from singing too much or playing too long on his favorite flute. During the Tokugawa period, literature, art, music, and drama, the things that perpetuate the human side of life, were regarded as evils by the ruling class, except as it directed them. The plays which grew out of the old marionette shows persisted as popular entertainment, and the acting production subtlety of dramatic expression and power of emotional appeal in the kabuki theater are highly esteemed to this day by the people at large. But only the classical no drama, with its extremely reserved action and ultra-refined taste, was permitted for the enjoyment of the samurai class in former times. The no are religious dramas, inculcating Buddhist morales. They were developed by the great masters of the art, 
in the 14th and 15th centuries and were inherited generation after generation by the families who founded the No Schools, such as Kanzi or Hosho under the patronage of the Daimyo or Samurai class. The leading performers play in skillfully carved masks appropriate to the characters portrayed, and their words are chanted or intoned to a particular kind of musical accompaniment, flutes, large drums, and tazumi, hand drums. Descriptive and explanatory passages being sung by the chorus. The dancers, masked and gorgeously robed in sweeping garments, move from the beginning to the end of the play through a series of stately posturings, each which is prescribed by tradition. The no drama had its own comedy, though of a formal nature. The Kyojin, or short farces, performed by way of relief. They now appear on no programs, ridiculing everything in heaven and earth, displaying the humorous aspects of the servant problem, of marital relations, the iniquities of priest, but to repress one's feelings to the limit of endurance became second nature to the Japanese. It is highly appreciated as a samurai virtue, but often misunderstood by people who do not know the background of Japanese culture and interpret restraint as a denial of the emotions. My father's ancestry spoke through his relation to the arts. He and my mother usually responded to the solemn effect of the no although my father occasionally hummed a little passage from Kyojin, cheerful and a little red in the face, from his rice wine after supper. When my mother came into my father's house as a young bride, she entered the family of his parents, brothers, sisters, cousins, student servants, and housemaids of various ages, more than twenty in number, Soon after my father, in his 23rd year, graduated from the university, my grandfather retired as active head of the household, and my father became the legal chief. His first salary of 60 yen a month was just about enough to support this big family, including the expense of sending his younger brothers and cousins to the Imperial University, at which he himself had graduated. The cost of living was about one-tenth of what it is at present, but it was hard for my mother to manage the family finances, even though each member of the group was brought up with the samurai habits of extreme thrift. It was a great extravagance, for instance, to purchase a bicycle for my father's younger brothers to ride in turn, instead of their having to walk all the way to the school, which was far from home. Only after long discussions did they get permission to buy one. Later, my father entered the Takata Trading Company. At that time, one of the largest foreign trading firms in Japan, all of which were busy <clears throat> importing machines for the industrialization of Japan. He was highly valued for his knowledge of mechanics. He was successful in the business field, especially when he showed his acumen by promptly purchasing munitions to meet the urgent demands of the Japanese Army and Navy during the Russo-Japanese War. He was in London during the war to prosecute this great undertaking. Later, his service was recognized by the government when he was decorated by the emperor, a rare honor for one who has not a direct official of the imperial government. 
the degree of Doctor of Engineering was conferred on my father by the Imperial University of Tokyo, and although he has now retired from business, he enjoys his chair at the university, giving lectures there. He is still head of the Hirota family, which numbers nearly a hundred members. My mother is rather tall for a Japanese. Her skin is smooth as ivory, and her hair is long and thick. She is intelligent, modest, unselfish, and always thoughtful of the other members of the family. She is particular about her manners and impresses everybody she meets with her graceful dignity. Strict with herself and formal, she plays the part of a samurai's wife majestically, as if in a dramatic performance. She rises earlier and retires later than anybody else in the family. She has never allowed herself to enjoy a lazy Sunday morning in bed, and the sick bed is the only place for her to rest. Nobody ever saw her sit in a relaxed manner. She is always erect, wearing her kimono tightly with her heavy sash folded on her back. Even on hot summer days, her thick black hair is dressed in the old-fashioned married lady style. I remember how I loved when a little girl to stay in her boudoir watching her hair being dressed. La Facadio Hearn, in his delicate style, described Japanese hairdressing. Volutes, jets, whirls, eddyings, foliations, each passing into the other blandly, like the linking of brush strokes in the writing of a Chinese master. Far beyond the skill of the Parisian Kofus is the art of the Kamayui, professional hairdresser. From the mythical era of the race, Japanese ingenuity has exhausted itself in the invention and the improvement of pretty devices for the dressing of women's hair, and probably there have never been so many beautiful fashions <clears throat> of wearing it in any other country as there have been in Japan. This formality will remain with us forever, just as kabuki plays will be appreciated even when talkies and reviews seem to have taken the whole ground in the world of amusement. Japanese girls now spend their school days in the so-called foreign-style uniform, with their hair cut short, but as soon as they are engaged and begin to prepare for the wedding, they let their hair grow to conform to the beautiful shimada, the bride style. No girl can look ungraceful when she leaves the hairdresser's hands. To come back to my mother's dressing room, where she sits patiently in front of her, her mirror for an hour or more once in every three days when the Kamayui comes to her house to arrange her hair. The Kamayui sends the maiden apprentice first, who cleans, steams, perfumes the hair, and finally combs it with instruments of various kinds, changing gradually from rough to fine ones. When this has been done, the Kamayui arrives with a comb which has a sharp hairpin at the end. She separates the hair into five sections and twists it in the marumage, the dignified married woman's fashion. Then the hair is tied with new white strings, especially made for the purpose, and a big round knot is fixed on the top, with four parts around it, puffed out, stiffened with oil, and sometimes lined with black paper. On her black hair, my mother usually wears stringed red coral beads, 
or green jade ones, inherited from her mother, a bit of dark blue tied and dyed crepe beneath the center knot, and a gilded and lacquered ornamental comb besides a hairpin or two of the same sort in front and on the sides. My mother uses polite words only, never liking to pick up the vulgar words spoken in the streets. She never betrays unpleasant feelings. Endurance and repression are her greatest ideals. She says to me, endurance a woman should cultivate more than anything else. If you endure well in any circumstances, you will achieve happiness. She never loses her temper with the servants, but is always dignified and gentle, however stupid or slow they may be. She hates ordinary theater going. Her stoic principle makes her regard a place of amusement as inappropriate for a samurai's wife, consequently. I was never allowed to go to a theater until I was married and had left her jurisdiction. However, she makes one exception. Attending the drama Chushin Guara, <clears throat> a true samurai play, she is absorbed in the moral spirit of this story of loyalty rather than in the artistic qualities of the play, and for days and days after she has seen a performance, she will say, Kichi Iman, the name of the well-known actor, particularly good as Yurano Suk, the hero, must have been sorry to undergo such horrible disgrace, she cannot distinguish the actor from the living character. My mother has accomplished all that is required of a wise parent and a good wife according to the standards of her generation. She has managed the household admirably and has brought up her six children well. She herself attended a Canadian mission school in Tokyo, which was considered a place of progressive education for Japanese girls. There she studied English and domestic science in the Western style. This helped her a good deal in understanding. My father, as befitted the wife of a progressive businessman, but her missionary education did not make her thoroughly Christian, nor did it greatly affect her way of thinking, for she was reluctant to be converted to the alien religion and stuck to the old moral code, which maintains that submission is the utmost womanly virtue. She was faithful to the old family system, humbly serving her parents-in-law, and her husband's sisters and brother, and yet, when I grew old enough to learn music as a part of the training of girlhood, she insisted on my learning the piano instead of the koto, thirteen-stringed harp, because she remembered how hard it had been for her to play the koto every day to please her mother-in-law, whether she was in a musical mood or not. Nevertheless, she did not wish her daughters to be exempt from the matter of pleasing mothers-in-law, as she believed that the performance of this obligation makes a woman's virtues brighter. Having inculcated this in her children, she dared to have her eldest daughter marry into a family with a mother-in-law who was said to be especially difficult to please. My mother was especially assiduous in educating her children. She made every effort to further their development, but her feudal concept of man first, woman to follow, was clearly seen in her treatment of her sons and daughters. Of course, the daughters took 
sex discrimination for granted, as they did not know anything else. My mother has never understood the moral beauty of romantic love between man and woman. She regards it as indicative of wild feelings, which can be allowed to exist only among vulgar people. Unselfishness, sacrifice, and endurance, that is all sufficient for woman, my honorable mother maintains. Chapter 2. Family Manners and Customs Since pre-feudal times in Japan, the third day of the third month has been the day for the Peach Blossom Festival. On this occasion, a pair of candles burn in the delicately framed paper lanterns on the top of a five-shelved stand covered with scarlet cloth, throwing soft light and shadow on the snow-white faces of the doll prince and princess. Crowned and dressed in gorgeous brocades, and set on their lacquer-framed throne, an ancient court is resurrected. Artificial plants of pink cherry and yellow-orange blossoms are placed on both sides of the throne on the top shelf. Three graceful dolls dressed in white brocade silk, robes with red hakama skirts, are the court ladies, and as such are placed below the royal dolls. Beside them are arranged the austere ministers of the left and the right, together with the household servants. Five musicians with flutes and drums are placed on the middle shelf. The display includes great numbers of miniature household utensils, furniture, dressing mirrors, bureaus, a whole cooking and dinner set, tea set, flower carriages, and even ox-drawn carts, all gilded and lacquered. A white and black toy pekingese is there with a handsomely uniformed maid-in-waiting. Every detail reveals exquisite workmanship in a style derived from ancient times. This festival is celebrated for the girls of the family. They invite their friends to the party, and the mother entertains. The small guests, who try their best to behave gracefully before the doll prince and princess. I was born on the eve of this festival. My parents' first daughter. My father was away at the moment, and not as ordinarily for business reasons. He was paying one of his rare visits to a performance at the No Theater, of which he was so fond. Greatly impressed by the austere play of Shiazuka, his mind was occupied on the way home with the story of this ancient woman of beauty and courage. When he arrived, to his surprise and joy, he was told that a daughter had been added to the household. On the seventh day afterwards, the family welcomed their latest child with a red rice and Thai fish feast, and the name of Shizu after the heroine of the no play, was given her by her father, who blessed the infant and expressed the wish that she might have a bright future and be brought up to be as brave as her ancient namesake. As the legend goes, Lady Shizuka was the beloved betrothed of the young general Yoshitsun, whose brother Yoritomo was the first shogun founder of the feudal government in this island empire 800 years ago. Very jealous, the shogun accused his younger brother, General 
Yoshitsune of treason. To escape persecution, Yoshitsune fled to a remote mountain. Then the shogun tried to take advantage of Shizuka. She was ordered to come to the shrine of Kamakura, Hachiman, and in the presence of hundreds of warriors, demonstrate by her homage the power of their lord. Shizuka was offended. She defied the shogun's command to betray her lover's hiding place. In her great loyalty to him, she performed, on the spur of the moment, a classic dance and composed, impromptu, a poem praising the glory of her lover, Yoshitsune. This historic event was dramatized in various ways later. My father hoped that I would exemplify this loyalty, naming me Shizuka. At this time, we were living near the Imperial University in Hongo, situated in the residential quarter reserved for the former retainers of Count Abe's family. The Togugawa feudal government ordered all the feudal lords to maintain, besides their castles on their estates, two mansions in Yedo, now Tokyo, an official residence called the Upper Mansion, and a private residence called the Lower Mansion. They were ordered to spend three years on their land, and the next three years in their Tokyo residence. This was one of the wise policies of the Tokugawas. It gave no time to any feudal lord to prepare war against the central government, and it made them all spend money traveling back and forth with their retinues, expensive daimyo processions. The upper mansions of the feudal lords were situated outside the beautiful moats of Yedo Castle. These estates, with their lovely classical Japanese gardens, are attractions here and there even today in Tokyo. In my infancy, Count Abe still occupied one of the upper mansions, and our family lived in its retainer's quarters. Shortly after I was born, my father bought a new house in Kojimachi, one of the best quarters of Tokyo, and we all removed to this place. The city of Tokyo has five million inhabitants, with its enlarged borders recently prescribed by the municipal administration. Greater Tokyo includes even wild outlying fields and the spacious beds of the Tama River. However, it is more natural for Tokyo people to think of the city in its old form, an area running about eight miles north and south, and the same distance east and west, its southwest border facing the deep arch-shaped Tokyo Bay on the Pacific. Tokyo, the eastern capital, was named in the year of the Meiji Restoration. Formerly it was called Yedo, and was the political center of this island empire for three centuries from the time of the Tokugawa shogunate was established and while it dominated the 300 feudal warlords Yedo Castle the present imperial palace surrounded by moats is situated in the center of Tokyo naturally the city has been rich with feudal reminders of unique and ancient charm but recently, busy westernization has gradually changed the old Japanese town into a modern city. Square tall concrete buildings and cement mortared red brick architecture with bands of glass windows for government offices and businesses places now replace the former daimyos 
mansions with sharply peaked gray tile roofs and with occasional large square windows hung with grass screens from behind which the gatekeepers used to watch the people on the street and historical gardens with century-old groves and ponds have been mercilessly destroyed to make way for boulevards. The delicately arced wooden bridges over the stone-walled moats of the Shogun's Palace and the picturesque canals of Yeddo have all been demolished for the building of new bridges in a style of monstrous ugliness to bear the heavy modern traffic. The great earthquake and the following conflagrations in Tokyo spurred modernization so fast that almost two-thirds of Tokyo today has completely lost its former beauty. As I recall the Tokyo of my childhood, my mind dwells on a quiet, charming town, so thoroughly Japanese it was, though my memories go back only three decades. This city is situated between two rivers, the Sumida and Tama. The former runs nearer what was the heart of the city in the ancient Yedo days, and undying romance and pleasure linger on its waters and banks. In my girlhood, I used to go to the river bank, Mukojima, to enjoy the cherry blossoms. The avenue of cherry trees continues along the banks, far beyond the city confines, and it has long been the custom of the people to enjoy gay spring picnics, dancing, singing, and playing the samison three-stringed guitar on red blankets spread on the turf under the canopies of bloom and color. When a spring wind brings mild air in early April, all these trees open their buds suddenly. Then Tokyo is, indeed, gay and rich. When I was very young, mother would give a day off to all her maids that they might see the flowers and the children would go with them for a picnic under the trees. Uyeno Park, one of the main amusement resorts in Tokyo, is covered with cherry blossoms in their season. When the aged trees around the red lacquered Kanyiji Temple are in blossom, the park with its rolling acres of evergreens is crowded with merry folk enjoying a carefree frolic. I used to wander among the throngs, clinging tightly to my maid's kimono sleeves so that I might not be lost in the crowd, watching brilliant paper balloons, looking at the artificial cherry flowers for ladies' hair offered for sale by peddlers. In later years, while I would still enjoy the flowers, I mingled less with the holiday crowds, viewing instead the mist-like blossoms amid the dark green pines of the Yeno Hills. From a distant point of vantage, from there one could see the cherries fringing the imperial moats along the red brick walls of the pre-earthquake British Embassy. The trees at that place were old and huge, laden with pale pink and snowy white blossoms. They made a superb contrast with a wide band of green turf on the far side of the moat. In a quiet promenade over the carpet of pink petals, one would be lost in the enchantment of the scene. Even after the cherry flowers are gone, blown away like snow, when fresh young leaves have sprouted out on slender hanging willow branches along the banks of the imperial moats, which wind beside the promenade. The flower season continues in Tokyo. White, pink, and rose 
tree peonies, purple and white bunches of wisteria, red and white camellia, white magnolia, and yellow yamabuki decorate the capital in private gardens, in the parks, and in the numerous temple courts. These courts are in effect little parks for children to play in and retreats in which old people may rest. Azaleas, white, dark, pink, purple, orange, yellow, and red blossom on the grassy slopes along the banks of the outer moats, ever-changing bands of color which flash into view as the electric tram winds in and out of the natural gardens lining the road. But in the month of June, the rainy season comes in Tokyo, calming the excitement of flower worshippers. The silver thread-like rain wets the houses, trees, and streets. Day after day, cleaning the dusty air of late spring, people go out walking on their two-bladed wooden clogs, five or six inches high, carrying big paper umbrellas with bamboo frames and handles, which add more grace to women as they walk. But the terrible humidity which accompanies the rain causes dreadful suffering among the poor who are crowded into the slums along unsanitary canals under the high bridges at the narrow points along the river and near the smoking chimneys of the industrial section. The melancholy days of Tokyo vanish suddenly with the brightness of summer's arrival. The coming of the summer season in Tokyo was long observed by a festival at the Ryogoku Bridge on the Sumida. All the tea houses and fashionable restaurants on the bank as well as the roofed boats on the river, were then lighted with colored paper lanterns. On balconies and roofs, wax candles flicker in the evening breeze. Men and women clad in the thinnest of yukata for the dark warm summer night enjoy a magnificent display of fireworks. The business people are native Yedoites, children of the old Yeddo traditions, who have lived in this locality for generations, active in every line of trade known to feudal times. They belong to the merchant class and preserve many of its old characteristics. Big business houses, theaters and tea houses, geisha quarters, the Yoshiwara pleasure enclosure, all are situated within the boundaries of southeast Tokyo. The other district is situated in the northwest of the city, where the level of the land is much higher and the formation is rolling. Many points of these hills command a view of the city Tokyo Bay and even Mount Fuji, miles and miles away. The former samurai class and the present-day upper middle class mingling with newcomers to the capital and with those who have moved up there to open small shops, make up the district residents. This quarter is rich with evergreen plantations, <clears throat> large groves in the imperial palace grounds, and other royal palaces. Streets are usually just wide enough for two motor cars to pass, exceptions being the grand boulevards in the center around the palaces and near the government buildings, and the straight roads at Nippon Bashi, Nippon Bridge. This was the former starting point of the Tokaido, the main highway of the country, running between Tokyo and Kyoto. The Kojimachi Ward, in the center of the city, contains the imperial palace, parliament buildings, court buildings, military and navy office of the government, police station, municipal hall, and the headquarters of all big firms. This ward of the Akasaka district 
where the subsidiary detached Imperial Palace is situated, with its huge expanse of garden, are the two most sparsely populated sections of the city, in the neighborhood of my father's home. All the residences occupy large tracts of land. From the gate to the house door, there is usually a long avenue, and at the back of the house, a spacious garden. Each house is surrounded by a six-foot wall of plaster or wood, and only the top of the house can be seen from the street. Before the motor car was introduced, when the rickshaw was the usual means of conveyance, with a few horse carriages for high nobles and horse-drawn trams on the main boulevards, there was nothing to cause noise or bustle in the city but the pleasant street cries of notto bean sellers in the very early morning, clear-voiced poor children, or the full-throated exclamations of a woman with a baby on her back. All through the hours of the day, the different vendors came and went. Their various ways of announcing themselves resounded cheerfully. In the afternoon, when people were preparing supper, the tofu sellers shouts enlivened the street. Modern science has discovered that this bean product, the tofu, is rich in vitamins, and consequently even westernized Japanese now enjoy tofu among the supper dishes. In the evening, the infrequent, shrill, piping, and melancholy note of blind mashures accentuated the quiet while the creaking sound of women's wooden clogs on the frozen street made winter nights seem chillier and lonelier. Until the summer of my fifteenth year, the residence in Kojimachi was our home. Then this house was torn down, and father built a house in European style, designed by a German architect, I love to remember the older Japanese house in Japanese style and its childhood's association, although I care very much also for my father's occidental dwelling, which has the air of an ancient European castle. The Japanese house had a tall, black-painted wooden gate from which a long, narrow path paved with shining white stones led to the house. On both sides of this walk were huge double cherry trees, pines and oaks, casting dark and cool shadows in the summertime. Japanese camellia, jingchoj, the sweet-smelling bay tree, kuchinashi, the cape jasmine, and white and yellow yamabuki, were planted among the big trees, shedding sweet odors in the spring. The plain wooden front gable of the house was barely seen through the thick tree branches. On the south side of the house was the major garden, with a huge pine tree in the center. A big weeping willow hung over the stone well. Old plum trees were there in shrubs, planted in abundance but in tasteful groups, separated from the main garden by low hedges of tea shrubs was a tea garden. The stone under the old maple tree here was especially admired for its unusual celadon hue and peculiar shape. Even tiny moss-covered stones scattered over the ground were prized and cared for, while dead leaves were swept up and taken away every morning by Toku, our gardener by profession, an artist in sentiment. I liked to watch him at the top of a pine tree as he used his scissors quickly and regularly with a pleasant clicking. He gave a good hair trimming to each tree, brushing up the pine needles almost one by one and giving a graceful twist to each maple branch. Often he paused, puffing at his long tobacco pipe and looking up 
at the tree at which he had been working. I particularly liked this pose. Although he was leisurely in his artistry, he was never self-indulgent. He smoked just one pipe, then he would knock out the ashes, still smoking hot, into the palm of his hand, scatter them, and return to his labors. Won't it burn your hand? I would anxiously ask him. No, don't worry, my little lady. Toku's hand is thick, like an ironing board. Over and over again, he examined the trimming of the trees and foliage. Later, he learned to plant western flowers in the flower beds in our back garden. And he said to me one day, My little lady, don't you know that Toku has learned English? What did you learn, Toku? I asked with curiosity. Platinap, carnation, strawberry, chirrup, hyacinth, anemone, glocketania. What? It's like Buddha's sutra. I laughed, but he insisted that it was English. Now he has thrown away his blue happy coats, his vocational symbol, and opened a charming curio shop. My father gave him a little house and this shop for his last years. Our Japanese home had two stories and was built in the center of the property. The roofs were of dark gray tiles, with a giant tile in the shape of the devil's face at each corner to charm away evil spirits. The tone of these tiles was in quiet harmony with the enveloping green trees, the drawing rooms, father's study, mother's sitting room, and all the other rooms, including the nursery, student servant's room, maid servant's room, Rikisha man's quarters, lantern room, big bathroom, and storage room were all designed in a zigzag way to break monotony. The floors of sitting rooms and bedrooms were covered with thick green mats bordered with black or brown, six by three feet. These mats were placed tightly side by side in the customary way the size of a room being known by the number of its mats. Thus a Japanese room is referred to as an eight mat room or a 12 mat room instead of 24 by 48 or 36 by 72 feet. Mother's 12 mat room was in the middle of the house. On three sides were small closets, divided into shelves and drawers where she kept her wardrobe in neat order. These closets were hidden behind beautifully patterned paper sliding screens, and one of them contained the family shrine. On memorial days, when the members of the family, for many ancestral generations were honored. She offered tea, boiled rice cakes, fruits, and flowers at the shrine, all in the diminutive table sets especially made for the Buddhist ceremony. Mother kept tins of biscuits and sweets in a room, and as children <clears throat> we delighted in these when we took tea with her. The south side of her room faced on the garden, and a part of the garden pond stretched beneath the veranda of the room. I remember my younger brother, Yoshi, and I often stretching out our hands to catch the gold fish in the pond, or chasing them in the water, wetting our kimonos dreadfully. Mother would gently scold us, saying she felt sorry for the little goldfish being disturbed like that. Corridors of plain wood connected our rooms. In a Japanese house, these are an important part of the architecture, and every morning and evening 
The maids polish them with a soft cotton cloth, so that they become almost as shiny as a mirror. In one corner of our house was a ceremonial tea room, artistically furnished, quiet and dark. Father used to talk with his friends there. All the rooms were closed by paper sliding doors or doors of sugi, Japanese cedar, and there was no key for any door except for the heavy plaster ones opening into the go-down. The go-down is a peculiarity Japanese institution, a place where family treasures were stored. It is a separate building, presumably fireproof, with heavy white plaster walls and high small windows. When we children were too naughty, my mother would put us into this dungeon-like place. My second younger brother had more experience of the go-down than the rest of us, crying loudly in its gloom. We all wore kimonos and sat neatly and picturesquely, each on a cushion on the mat floor. Father wore the kimono at home, but when he went to his office in the morning, he donned his London-made morning coat or a business suit and a bowler hat. As he departed, he gave a light nod to the members of the family who came together to the front entrance to bow him off. Then he rode away on his rickshaw drawn by Katsu, our family servant. When he came back, the rattling of the iron tires of the rickshaw against the white stone pavement of the avenue was heard far inside the house. It was the signal for the children to run out, mother and all the maids following to bow the master in. Thus I was brought up in a purely Japanese fashion, but Western influences crept into our life little by little, and whenever my father went to Europe on a business trip, he brought back chairs, tables, desks, bureaus, piano, and pianola, cinematograph, sewing machines, and children's clothes. But my father was the only one of us then who actually had seen the Western countries, the rest of the family knowing about them only through the stories and objects he brought back. For this reason, our Japanese life could not be changed in its essence, and my little sisters wearing Western dresses were carried on their nurses' backs, like little girls dressed in kimonos, and slept just as peacefully after their lullaby, ninin yo o okorori yo Memories of the new year in those days are among the most delightful. Japanese people believe at the new year everything must be fresh. Not only the year and the day, but man himself must be spiritually renewed. My mother began two weeks ahead to get ready for the new year, helped by the servants. A grand dusting day inaugurated the preparation. The ceilings, the back of the mats, and every corner of the closets and drawers were cleaned. Big bunches of pine and bamboo bows were brought to decorate the gate, and the same decoration was placed at every entrance of the house to welcome the good fortune which the coming year was to bring. My mother arranged pine branches and plum flowers in the big bronze vase and put them into the alcove of the room where guests were received. Special dishes, enough to last three days for the family and its guest, were carefully prepared in the kitchen. Daintily cut vegetables, cooked chicken, meat, and fish were assembled in piles upon piles in the square black lacquer and gold boxes strictly prescribed 
for this occasion. At the time, fixed for the pounding of rice cakes, which came a few days in advance of New Year, the children got up about four o'clock in the cold winter morning as soon as they heard the familiar sound in the backyard under the shining stars. Its sound was like an announcement of festivities. The servants had already steamed rice on the stove, temporarily set up in the yard, and Katsu and Toku pounded the steamed rice in a big wooden mortar. Then they kneaded it on a board into big square or small round cakes, smiling all the while. Kimonos and Obis, snow white socks, lacquer clogs, red underwear, silver flowers for the hair with long red tassels were all new for the holiday. Only the brocade sashes might be old. They were handed down from mother to daughter for several generations. So much had to be finished by New Year's Eve that my mother and all the servants went to bed very late that night, often after they had heard the first cock proclaiming the New Year's dawn. On the morning of the great day, the family got up early to watch the sunrise and to bow in honor of the sun goddess. Then all the members gathered together in the grand sitting room and passed round the sake cups, bowing and wishing each other a happy new year. These sake cups were of lacquer and gold, piled one upon the other. in three layers and placed on a lacquer stand. Each cup bore the family coat, coat of arms in gold. On the second day of January, my father invited the staff of his company to our house for a feast. The two big rooms on the upper story were given over to the banquet, and the gentlemen, gay with New Year wines, laughed and sang, but no lady was included in the party. In those days, ladies paid a New Year's visit to one another after the 15th of January, but they were allowed to wish one another a Happy New Year at any first meeting throughout the month of January. The New Year meant a long observance and celebration in those slow, <clears throat> leisurely days. Now that has all been changed. My mother was often ill during the strenuous New Year season, but the children had only fun. They played all day long in the garden with battle doors and shuttlecocks, or a game played with 31-syllable poem cards. We often said we wish the new year would stay longer, but among my mother's burdens were the presents to be sent out to all our relatives and friends during this season. Moreover, there were the seventh day festival, the fifteenth day festival, and the days for the servants' holidays, to mention only a few matters to which she must attend. We never dined out, for it was considered undignified except when formally invited. Later, when I spent a New Year's Eve in New York, watching the bustle on Broadway, the gay restaurants, where men and women dined together cheerfully, I was struck by the sharp contrast between the domestic burdens put on the shoulders of the housewives in Japan and the freedom of women in New York. Though it has been much simplified recently, the Japanese New Year is still the most festive time for the nation and the most torturesome for wives and mothers. In the list of the social festivities, the second 
in importance is Oban, the Feast of Lanterns. It turns suddenly warm after our spring long rainy season is over. But a busy fortnight in the heat comes to every housewife. The middle of the seventh month is set aside for the Bon Festival. During that time, families exchange presents again, as they do at the New Year's season. On the 13th of July, the family shrine is cleaned. Meals, joss sticks, and burning candles are placed before it. According to Buddhist tradition, it is thought that all the departed members of the family come back for the three days of the festival, when there are members who have newly been listed in the Book of the Dead. The relatives send paper lanterns to the family shrine. At my father's home, when the priest came, we sat in front of the shrine, observing the rites. The priest first read a Sanskrit sutra in a loud voice, meanwhile ringing a bell, burning incense, and bowing many times. Then he read another sutra and bowed. He repeated this for some time. When the ceremony was over, Father stood up and stepped to the shrine to burn incense. Then Mother followed and the children in the order of their ages. But when the turn came for my naughty younger brother, his little legs had gone to sleep, and he could hardly crawl to the shrine. Our family religion was Sodu Shu, one of the subdivisions of Zenism, a Buddhist faith. Nobody in the family talked about Buddha or worshipped him with any religious sentiment, but we considered the Buddhist temple the proper place to bury our dead. We were brought up indifferent to any creed, merely following the formalities of the family religion, in which the Feast of Lantern played the most important role. My mother never allowed us to leave the city for our summer home until she had taken us to the ancestors' graves during the Feast of Lanterns in the middle of the hot July. Afterwards, we went to the seashore at Kamakura to stay until cool weather returned to Tokyo. In the midst of the still persisting feudal mode of my life, when the family was almost a self-sustaining community, my mother's household duties were overwhelmingly numerous. She was responsible not only for the cleaning, the washing, the cooking for the large household, for keeping immaculately clean the house with its many rooms and zigzag corridors, and attending to the thick wooded spacious gardens, but also for the annual supply of bean paste, for breakfast soup, and the great barrels of pickles for every season and every kind of meal. The cleaning of the house consisted not merely of dusting and polishing, but of repapering the hundreds of screens at least twice a year. Being delicate, these were easily torn, and the children found secret delight in sticking their fingers through them when their parents were not looking. Cats, too, added to the mischief caused by the children by scratching and making passages through the screens. The washing was as complicated as the cleaning of the house, for the winter kimonos, hoary coats, obi sashes, and underwear all lined and often padded with cotton or raw silk, had to be taken apart, laundered, starched, and dried on boards or frames, and put together again. The bed quilts and cushions had to undergo the same process. Because of the poor heating system, 
the winter clothing and bedding were large, heavy, and numbered many pieces, adding to the burdens of the housewife. My mother had many faithful servants, however, to help her with her numerous household duties. For generations, young maids from the same families came to us to learn house management and stayed with us until they married. Mothers and daughters, sisters or cousins entered our household and worked faithfully, never thinking of changing master or mistress. Indeed, it was a shame for them to do so. Oko, for instance, was with my mother before I was born and remained with her longer than I did. Chapter 3 Childhood Yukichi Fukuzawa, a prominent educationist in the early Meiji period and a forerunner of the feminist movement, says in his book on Japanese women, it is a shame to treat one's better half as a tool giving a prize when a woman gives birth to a son, but sons were exclusively welcome to the family, especially the firstborn. My father was not so old-fashioned as to give a prize to my mother when my eldest brother was born as his heir. He gave his son a name, however beginning with a character which signifies filial piety, for he considered that to be the first and fundamental moral precept for this child, receiving the gentlest care befitting the firstborn son. My elder brother was shy and quiet in his nature. He never quarreled with his brothers and sisters and behaved with dignity from his early years but he was afraid to go to the kindergarten. When the time came, he wound his arms tightly round a pillar in the house, the farthest from the front door. He was too timid to sing when told by the teacher to do so. His resistance was not resentment, and his sense of dignity saved him from anger. My second brother was named with the Chinese character Ocean because he was born while father was abroad. He was naughty and intelligent, keeping always at the head of his class from primary school to college. When I was almost five years old, Chio, my nurse, I told me that twin sisters had been born to the family. I remember peeping in at the wee babies, tiny like my dolls, sleeping in beds covered with red quilts. My mother always dressed them exactly alike. They both had very big, bright eyes. When they were old enough to go to school with me, the teacher asked my mother to tie their hair with ribbons of different colors so that she could identify them. I used to have more boys than girls for companions, as I liked to be out of doors, playing baseball and tennis, or climbing trees. Bamboo stilt riding was my favorite pastime. Toku often made bamboo stilts with a pair of long straight stalks, six or sometimes eight feet tall, to which were attached pieces of wood <clears throat> to hold the feet. When I rode these stilts, I felt suddenly grown up high and walked like a giraffe or ostrich in a zoo with long, long steps. My mother, of course, did not approve of this, saying complainingly, you can't be married if you behave like a boy that way. But I thought Keo and Kyo, my gentle twin sisters, could be good brides in my place. These two girls preferred to stay indoors, playing with dolls and cooking the New Year's feast for them. 
they cleverly designed a fashion book in both Japanese and European modes for their little dolls. They made their own dolls and arranged these alongside their manufactured dolls on silk cushions in the nursery. One day, Toku told me that we were to have a big farm in the suburbs of Tokyo and to spend our weekends there. Toku was promoted to the superintendent's post on this new estate. On our first trip to the farm, we took the tram car, which carried us to the northwest terminal of the city. There we changed to another tram, which ran along rough suburban roads, past rows of small shops and flat houses. The outskirts of Tokyo consist of level land divided into vegetable gardens and forest of chestnuts and other woods with rolling hills everywhere in the distance. Large open spaces spread out along the Tama River, which runs to the sea, fed by many small streams. Its clear water is used by the city dwellers. Every Sunday, after riding 20 minutes on the slow electric tram, we got off and took a pleasant walk along the bank of the creek to our farm, carrying white rice, boiled eggs, cold chicken, and vegetables. Arranged in the partitioned lacquer boxes, which were so heavy that we had developed a good appetite by the time we reached the farm. Covering acres of land, the country place was picturesque, with tall twisted pine woods on the west side, where we would hang hammocks and read or take naps. The shrill young cicadas thrilled rather than offended us. Adjacent to the pine woods was a chestnut forest and a thick grove of tall bamboo, the round, straight, graduated trunks lifting high, the leaves rustling pleasantly over our heads as they touched and rubbed in the breeze. Often we hunted young bamboo sprouts, digging in the black soft earth around their roots. A brook ran through the forest, where we could catch little fish, and where myriads of tadpoles frolicked in the paddy pools along its bank. The rest of the land on the Musashino Plain was open under the immense arc of the azure sky. At the center of the property, on the top of a gentle slope, my father built an artistic Japanese weekend villa of small five-mat rooms, tennis courts covered with soft green lawn, flower beds, hot houses, an orchard and a vegetable garden were there for us to enjoy. We satiated our thirst, thirsty throats, with strawberries, loquats, and persimmons, fresh and abundant. It was real recreation coming to this farm, and we thanked our father who did so much for the happiness of his children. With the rapid development of the suburbs and the ever-increasing population, this sort of delightful spot in the neighborhood of the city had been consumed by Greater Tokyo. The people have lost the unspoiled fragrance of earth in a breath of air and the natural aspect of the sun sinking below the horizon, leaving a reflection on the forest as crows go back to their nest in the pine groves. All these lovely places of former days have been altered from green meadow lands into crowded modern estates. The picturesque old thatched cottages have given way to cheap 
wooden houses with roofs of galvanized iron and red-brown painted tin, which cram the narrow, crooked suburban streets. Foreigners are often puzzled by this aspect of Japan. Visits to the farm were varied by trips to the beach, to Kamakura, about 40 miles from Tokyo. Today, Kamakura is a healthful residential spot for suburbanites who travel daily to the capital. In the summer, Tokyo residents move in mass to the Kamakura shore for the sea bathing, riding every day by hundreds of thousands on the government railway. All the year round, it is the mecca of sightseers. About 800 years ago, this town was the capital of Japan. Yoritomo established the first feudal government there. The place is well favored by nature, surrounded by wall-like hills, opening only on its south side. Yui Beach on the Pacific. The climate is mild at all seasons, and the scenery is marvelous. The giant Buddha meditates at Kamakura upon his lotus throne, set against a background of hills covered with green forest of ancient pines and cherries and plums. They are planted in the Buddha's garden, pouring showers of pink petals and delicate scent over him in the spring. Gently, dreamily, passionlessly, he reposes. The solemnly beautiful face with the half-closed eyes has been described by Lafakidio Hearn as typifying all that is tender and calm in the soul of the East. Kamakura is rich with many other historical monuments and century-old shrines and temples. The red lacquered shrine of Hachiman and two most famous temples of the Zen sect, Ingakuji and Kinchoji are surrounded by deep forest of mast-like cryptomira, whose tall brown trunks, straight and aspiring, lift the visitor's eyes to the sky, which fills him with serenity. In these holy places, I loved the religious solemnity of the atmosphere at the Ingakuji and Kinchoji temples, one passes through numbers of gates of stupendous structure, with sweeping curves and huge gabled roofs. Big tablets written in Chinese attract the eye. At Kinchoji temple, I used to climb up the dilapidated stone steps, with grass springing in every breach and break up the shady hill road to the little temple of the famous bell, several hundred years old. The bronze bell itself is nine feet high, its surface covered with text from the Buddha Sutra. It rolls out deep yet musical sounds over the hills, a mournful murmur which long continued and echoing back from the hills led my thoughts far back to the Japan of feudal days, when Kamakura was at its peak of glory. The ancient graves of feudal heroes and their women are arranged in the quiet temple courts, their eternal sleep uninterrupted by the soughing pine woods at the front of the inner temple hall are plain round wooden pillars, cross beams, and vast eaves which sustain the ponderous and complicated upper structure. Temple fountains of bronze stand before the doors. From its immense and beautiful metal lotus leaf, forming a broad shallow basin kept full to the brim by a jet in its center, I was wont to scoop handfuls of crystal water 
to quench my thirst. These were all dear places to my childhood, and they remain both dear and unchanged. My grandfather lived at Kamakura after he retired from social activities, and my mother sent her six children to this summer place every year from July to September, and sometimes during the short holidays in the spring. In those slow and leisurely days, a trip from Tokyo to Kamakura was a full day's undertaking. A train of several rickshaws would carry my mother elder brother, myself, younger brothers, and sisters and maids. Two youngsters would ride in a rickshaw together, and one or two rickshaws carrying big trunks of bedding, spare kimonos and accessories, books and toys all wrapped up in the big square green furo shiki. Cloth for wrapping would follow in the rear of the procession, the rickshaw man ran with speed on the flat roads along the moat under the hanging branches of willows or down hilly roads between the brick government buildings to Hibiya Park. But they were slow when they climbed hills, making zigzag curves, while the persons who were riding would bend their bodies forward trying to cause these men less strain. About 40 minutes' ride would bring us to Shimbashi Station. We can reach it in five minutes by motor today, the terminus of the Tokaido Railway. There we bought tickets, checked the luggage, and waited for the guard to ring a handbell, announcing the train. In the train, my mother would hush the children who, being so excited, were always in a state of commotion, for to be on a train was a rare treat for us. We never tired of looking out of the windows. After ten or fifteen minutes' ride, we would come so close to the shore of Tokyo Bay, the water came so near to the track, that the waves would almost wash over the rails. Not far away, several square islands, built on piles of natural stones, and covered with green turf, could be seen when the sea was calm. These were the Odaiba, the naval fortifications erected by the Tokugawa government to protect the city from naval invaders. Here, the white sails of cargo and fishing boats would be appearing and disappearing again, between the artificial green islands. Between Tokyo and Kamakura, the train would stop at 11 stations, each time for 5 to 10 minutes, prolonging the trip on the train to fully 3 hours. In repeating this slow journey many times, all the scenery along the route became thoroughly and affectionately impressed on my mind. When the railway line ran a little nearer to the wooded hillside along the Tokaido. The views on both sides were continuations of farms and rice fields, with pine and chestnut trees, bamboo and shrubs covering the slopes. The farms from Omori to Yokohama Harbor would be covered with the yellow blooms of Natain and Rose Ringe would thickly carpet the rice fields in the spring. It was an immense spread of velvet-like verdure lined with yellow, rose, and green patterns luxurious to the eye. Another delightful panorama from the train window in the spring was the succession of peach orchards. They came in flat masses of trees five or six feet high. As the train sped along, one saw a succession of pink and white blossoms, a peach tree in full bloom near a farmer's cottage, contrasted with the rich brown thatched roof and made the blossoms look 
like a blazing jet of fire. But in the late summer, the view from the train was nothing but green, green foliage and green fields. Only one sixth of Japan is arable, which is a great pity from an economic standpoint, but highly ad advantageous from the point of beauty. The cultivated regions themselves are broken up by invading mountains and long arms of sea, where crops give way to forests or to fishing villages. One of the charms of the country is the endless, intricate extent and rich variety of its coastline. Japan has no great rivers, such as those running through continental lands, but it is full of mountain streams, cut off into irrigating ditches to supply the paddy fields. The rice fields are built in rectangular plots with narrow lines of black soil for partitions, and in early June, in adjoining fields, the harvesting of the first wheat and the transplanting of the rice begin. This transplanting is terribly hard labor to the onlooker. At least, it seems appalling. A group of eight or ten young men and maidens in line, the orange or purple obus and red underskirts of the girls, their hair covered with white and blue tengui towel, impart <clears throat> a touch of gaiety to the picture, their kimonos tucked up above their rugged knees. All of them advance together in a strong march over the flooded fields. These rice fields of vivid green in the summer and waves of golden brown in the autumn harvest season meet the eye of travelers all through the country where the soil is arable and fit for irrigation. Around Tatsuka, a flat territory of farms, the land is narrow and the landscape more hilly. The rural cottages dotted here and there along the road or on the hillside are strangely picturesque in their ancient style, dingy, neutral tinted, and steeply sloping roofs of thatch above clay walls and paper shoji screens. Often on the sloping roofs are green patches of some sort of moss and on the ridges, rows of sweet flag bearing pretty purple flowers. I loved those gardens on the roofs of village cottages and wanted to plant similar ones on my father's villa in Kamakura. After running through a tunnel, we were at Kamakura Station. On the open ground outside the station, a fleet of rickshaws was always awaiting the travelers. There would follow then another procession of rickshaws. Their speed is slower in the country, which would carry us through the narrow streets of Haas, then turn down to the little town on the seashore, redolent with the odor of drying seaweed, borne from the shore by the gentle breeze. This harbinger of vacation and seaside would excite us children, and we would jump from the small platform of our rickshaws and present ourselves gaily to our grandfather, impatiently watching for our coming. My grandfather was a true samurai, very stubborn, unwilling to accept a new social order. We loved him, but with a touch of fear. He suffered from rheumatism, and could not walk without someone to support him. Ordinarily, he sat in a big chair, with a nurse attending him. When the children made too much noise, Grandfather's thunder broke through the whole house, and we ran upstairs to our haven of safety. Our house at Kamakura was situated at the western edge of the town. It was built on the cliff at the foot of the 
Inamura Gasaki Promontory, whose green arm stretches far into the bay. The house had an excellent view of the whole town and the broad beach of dun-colored sand, which continues on the farther side of the horseshoe arc, embracing the bay, the water ebbing and flowing made a pleasant sound all day and night, bringing also a delicious occasional breeze into the villa through the opened shoji screens. On a moonlight evening, the long line of beach and the flickering reflections of light on the calm water seen through twisted old pine trees surrounding the house made us sentimental Beyond the straight line of land was another peninsula, then once more a land fading gradually into the farther distance with a chain of dotted lights twinkling and twinkling without sound. In the morning the sea was blue and it gradually turned into a deep cobalt as the sun mounted high. When the air was clear far away on the horizon, Specked with snowy sails, the silhouette of Oshima, the volcanic island covered with camellia blossoms, appeared like a dream island, like vapor from the summit of the volcano. We spent most of the day bathing. Sometimes we collected different kinds of butterflies and cicadas, or gathered innumerable kinds of dainty pink purple, gray, or white shells, so pearly on Japanese shores, and kept them in caskets as if they were precious jewels. There were a good many of my schoolmates spending the summer here, so the long days were never too long for me. Evenings were spent with my grandfather, who told us old, old stories of how he fought for his lord in the Civil War at the time of the Meiji Restoration. And it was the fashion at this summer resort to take a stroll after supper. This attempt at evening cooling, according to the Japanese fashion, was somewhat playful. I shall long remember searching for coolness with my girlfriends by sitting on the edge of the fishermen's boats, drawn up on the shore, while far away the rim of shoreline sparkled with lights. The plaintive tones of bamboo flutes were wafted from village cottages, and the breeze from the ocean toyed with our hair and our blue and white yukata kimono sleeves. Often strolling along the narrow country streets, lined with little shops, we carried paper lanterns marked with our family crest, with their names dyed in big white Chinese ideographs. These shops exhibited fascinating miniature articles against their indigo draperies. Our mother permitted us to buy some souvenirs each year before we left Kamakura. How I struggled with indecision amidst these mountains of sea treasures. There were sets of golden screens made out of numerous varieties of pearl-like shells, on which was pasted a picture of Mount Fuji, or of cherry blossoms, or small chest and boxes suitable for decoration, and jewelry for girls, rings, hairpins, brooches, necklaces, combs, small fans, all so alluring and at fabulously low prices. When it was getting on towards the end of August, Insects began to contribute their sweet music in the grassy thickets along the hillsides. My grandfather could not go out to the hills to hear them, 
as he would have loved so much to do. So it was the task of the grandchildren to bring the insects to him. Wild autumn plants with pink, white, and yellow flowers were growing almost high enough to hide us. We took with us to the hill a sheet of grass mat, which one of us held horizontally, making a wall in the grass, while another hung a lantern by the mat wall. Then the rest hunted in the grass. The poor insects, disturbed in their musical mood, jumped towards the light and fell against the mat. We caught them and put them into our bamboo cage. These insects are about one inch long, with gauze-like wings of a beige color. The matsumushi, pine insect, has a brown spot on each wing and a complicated trilling note, while the suzumushi, bell insect, has a soft, long, drawn monotone. Their orchestral music is as dear to the Japanese as the spring bird's call is to Western people. Our Matsumushi and Suzumushi were hung under the caves of the veranda outside Grandfather's room. <clears throat> Chen Chen Chichiro Rin, the pine insect, sang, and the bell insect turned in with Rin 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 for the night-long concert. In the morning, we fed the little musicians with fresh cucumbers and sliced eggplant. How Grandfather adored pine insects. I preferred the bell insects, but occasionally when I woke in the night and heard these insects singing in the darkness of the long corridor, an immense loneliness came over me without reason. When this village began to decorate its front eaves with red paper lanterns, heralding the autumn festivals, we prepared for our return to the city, leaving Grandfather behind, lonely except for the bell insects and the pine insects in the cage and the wild crickets which had gathered without an invitation in our garden to join this grand orchestra. My grandfather passed away peacefully at the age of seventy. In his will he left me a brown crepe furoshiki with white mountain cherry blossoms dyed upon it, a red tisushu carved and red lacquered jewelry box, and a manuscript bound with a purple silk cord bearing the title Ona Dagaku, Great Learning for Women, in beautiful Chinese ideographs. I cherished these three things with affectionate and reverent remembrances of my grandfather, but later, when I realized what was written in the manuscript, I could not help revolting against the conception of woman disclosed in this book. It was the epitome of all I have had to struggle against, the moral code which has chained Japanese women to the past. It made me see, not myself, but all women of my race, yesterday, today, and perhaps tomorrow. What a strange present to give a young girl.